Welcome to 2021, your year of supernatural tolerance. That shall be so for you. We are still on the topic, engaging biblical covenant for profitable living. Engaging biblical covenant for profitable living. And we have said it before, our God is a covenant keeping God, not a Father Christmas God. There is always a reason for divine intervention. This simply means when God makes a promise to man, it comes with a condition. And once you engage yourself in meeting the conditions of the, co of the promise, it translates into a covenant. It's no longer a promise because God is bound to perform. If he doesn't do that, he becomes unfaithful, but God is not unfaithful. The Bible said, even if we are unfaithful, he abides faithful because he can't deny his nature. He can't become unfaithful because you are unfaithful. So God is always faithful. So a covenant, a promise translates or progresses into a covenant when we meet the demands of that promise. The conditions attached to that promise. For instance, he said, bring ye all the tithes and offering into my storehouse and prove me therewith if I will not open the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing such that there is no room enough to contain it. This is why it is wisdom to find out from scriptures what God wants you to do and then do it. In order to find out, you must look into the perfect law of liberty. That's what James chapter 1 verse 25 says. Anyone who looks into the perfect law of liberty, not being a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the works, this man shall be blessed. And the blessing brings riches. Say the blessing of the Lord, it makes rich. The blessing brings preservation. Destroy it not. A blessing is in it. The blessing brings multiplication. When the five loaves was blessed, it multiplied and fed thousands. So the cheapest access to kingdom blessings is discovering the sayings and doing them is your guarantee against the day of trouble. He said, the Lord hear thee in the day of trouble. The name of the God of Jacob defend thee. How will you be defended? Whosoever hears these sayings of mine and does them I will liken him unto a man that built his house upon a rock. Practicing true Christianity is building your destiny on the rock. The power of the word is in the doing. You want to see the power of the word of God be a practitioner of the word. Not just being a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the works. The same shall be blessed. I say mega blessings coming your way. This morning, this evening rather, we are focusing on biblical covenant for Entronment. Biblical covenant for entronment. What do we mean by entronment? We mean being absolutely in charge of your life, of your destiny. Having principalities and powers in subjection unto you. That's being entroned. Having life the way you desired it based on the discoveries you have made from the scriptures. Saying things about your life and seeing them happen the way you have said it. Ecclesiastes chapter 8 verse 4. Where the word of a king is, there is power. When you are enthroned, your word becomes authority. In heaven, your word is respected because whatsoever you now bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatever you lose on earth is loosed in heaven. Angels respect your declarations because you are enthroned. 
Devils respect you because you are enthroned. Paul, I know. Jesus, I know. Who are you? Are you a king? Who are you? Without enthronement, even the, day, the name of Jesus can be very powerless and weak when it's declared. In the name of Jesus, I'm talking about Jesus whom Paul preached. And Paul preached, he died and resurrected. I'm talking about Jesus of Nazareth. In the name of Jesus, you devil come out. And the devil said, this is noise. The name that you are mentioning, the name means nothing if you are not enthroned. And it is God's will, his perfect will, that every Christian raised in life, every seed of Abraham is ordained to reign in life. In Galatians chapter 3 verse 29, it says, if ye be Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and has according to the promise. What is the promise? Entrumment. What are scriptural indications that God has promised entrumment for you? I will give you some specific scriptures. Number one, Romans chapter 5 verse 17. They that have received abundance of grace abundance and the gift of righteousness what will happen to them they shall reign in life by their partnership with Jesus Christ the moment you receive abundance of grace then you have been equipped to reign when you are reigning, your prayer point changes. You don't ask God for many things. You command. Paul prayed and prayed. Thrice I besought the Lord that he might take this thing out of me. That's 2 Corinthians chapter 12. He said in verse 7, he prayed twice. Twice. And then the reply came in verse 9. My grace is enough. You have what it takes to handle it. My grace is enough. For my strength is made perfect in weakness. Is it Paul stop praying to me? You can handle it. What you have is enough to silence every opposition. To deal with every situation. Moses had the rod in his hands and Israel was still crying unto God. And God said, why are they crying? Tell the people to go forward. Moses, use your rod and divide the Red Sea. To be enthroned is to be empowered. Abundance of grace is empowerment to reign. Christianity is endowment with grace to live for Christ on earth. It is not an escape route to heaven. It is a call to relevant living on earth. It is a call to live your life such that a table is prepared for you in the presence of your enemies and you can still enjoy that table because you have authority. It's only kings that will eat comfortably cross their leg in the presence of their enemies. The enemies are there. I say, yes, sir, yes, sir. Because they have been subdued. Second scripture that shows us that you are a partaker of this promise of enthronement. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 2 and verse 3. Know you not that the saints shall judge the world. The word there, judge, means rule. Because there is only one eternal judge, which is God. And he said, thou shalt not judge. So here, know you not that the saints shall rule the world? And if you shall judge, Amen. 
verse 2, verse 3. Know you not that we shall judge angels? How much more things that pertain to this life? That means <laughs> the, the calling is higher than even things of this life. So things of this life are minor things compared to your calling. For Ephesians 2 verse 6 says, And he has raised us up and made us to sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Every child of God is ordained to reign over devils. When you speak, they run. When you say go like Jesus, they go. Every child of God is ordained to have control over the forces of nature, over economy. In 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 8, it said, And God is able to make all grace, grace again, abound towards you. So when grace is abounding, then you can have all sufficiency in all things at all times in order to do good works. Can you say how we reign? When you are reigning, you are not afraid of evil. In Luke 9 verse 1, he gave them power over devils to cast them out. Over devils. Gave them power and authority over all devils. Chapter 10 verse 19, Luke 10 19, behold I give unto the authority power to tread upon serpents and scorpions and over every power of the devil and nothing shall by enemies hurt you. You are born to reign and you will reign. You will have authority over sickness. Authority over death. In 1 Corinthians chapter 3 verse 20 and 21 he said, no, you know, all things are yours. And again, okay, verse 21, rather, 21, 22. 1 Corinthians 3, 21. Therefore, let no man glory in man, for all things are yours. Because you are in charge and you are reigning. Whether it be Paul or Apollos or Severus or the world or life or death. When you are reigning, you have command and control over life and death over things present, over things to come. All things are subject unto you. To reign means to have an easy sail through life. That is your calling. And that is why you are in church. You are here to be trained to reign. Because without training, there can be reigning. You are here to be empowered to reign because without power you can't reign. The church is a training ground. It's a place where people are equipped. They are not just here to sit down, stand up, clap hands, smile, rejoice, drop your offering, go home, come back the same day, the next day, the same way, the same person. No. Not at all. What then are the key things that must be in place if I must keep reigning? Number one is that you must have a relationship with God through Jesus Christ as Lord. That makes you a son and not just a worshiper of God or a churchman. It makes you a son of God. John chapter 1 verse 12 as many as received him to them he gave power to become the sons of God. They are empowered. So your first step into empowerment is a genuine relationship with God. Serving God in spirit and in truth because you have met the Lord Jesus Christ who himself is light Hear this. Thank God Jesus reigns, but he wants you to reign also. 
in Revelation 5, verse 10, he said, he has made us kings and priests unto God his Father, and we shall reign on the earth. We shall reign on the earth. In this city, you will reign. You will control the market. You will control the economy. In that office, they will respect your word. In that office, they will respect your opinion. In that office, they will fear you. The stranger shall fade away from their sacred place. As you are entering, evil men are on the run. As you are entering, your, your adversaries are disappearing. When you are reigning, conspiracy against you fails. It boomerangs upon them. Number two is wisdom. It takes wisdom for you to be enthroned. A wise man is strong. A man of knowledge increases strength. The wisdom of God is a major instrument for reigning. Otherwise, your reign becomes a reign of terror and disaster and short-lived. What secures your enthronement is the wisdom of God at work in your life. And the scriptures is the wisdom bank of God. In first, second Timothy chapter 3 verse 16, 15 rather, second Timothy 3 15, from a child you have known the holy scriptures. Second Timothy 3, not first Timothy, second Timothy 3 15, from a child that has known the holy scriptures which are able to make you wise unto salvation. Unto deliverance. Number three is stewardship. Radical stewardship. Tireless stewardship. Getting sold out to the interests of God and his kingdom. Seeing yourself as a servant of Yahweh. So that you can say like Elijah, if I be a man of God, let fire come down. Your still worship gives you boldness in the day of battle. Ah. If I'm truly serving this God of the winner's family, ah, this sickness can remain. This situation must change. Darius said, Daniel, the God whom you serve continuously, deliver you. He knew this Daniel is serving a living God. And he said, I have not called the house of Jacob to seek me in vain. So, don't be a watcher, a spectator in the house of the Lord. Get involved. If you can sing, join choir. If you can't sing, join choir and train your voice. You can usher. You can do many things. Above all, you can get involved in soul winning. Number four is dedication. Dedication will always bring glorification. In John chapter 12, verse 23, Jesus said, the hour have come that the son of man might be glorified. Then in verse 24, he said, except a seed of corn falls into the ground and dies, it abides alone. But if it dies, it brings forth much fruit. To be dedicated means you are dead to criticism, you are dead to praise, you are dead to poverty, you are dead to prosperity, you are dead to affliction, you are dead to pleasure. Amen. Nothing moves you so far as your connection to God is concerned. You are sold out to God. Just like God's servant Bishop said, if I'm still riding my old beetle, even till today, it won't affect my zeal, it won't affect my joy, I will still be as committed and dedicated like never before. For I am not serving God for things. I'm serving him for who he is to me. The moment your life is like a seed. Then the things 
you have been struggling to get comes easily and cheaply. When you are dedicated, even fruitfulness, I don't have a child, it's no longer a cause, it's no longer, a cost, it's no longer an issue. You are rejoicing in plenty. You are rejoicing in scarcity. You are rejoicing in trial. You are rejoicing in victory. How is a man like Paul? Amen. Look at that. In Romans chapter 5, from verse 2. Romans 5, from verse 2. Okay, verse 3. Okay, verse 2 first. Verse 2 is okay. Verse 2, he said, By whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Verse 3. And not only so, but we glory in tribulations. Can you say we glory in tribulations? That means even in, tribulation means multiplied problem. Even when the problem are multiplied, you can still rejoice and glory as if to say they don't exist because you are dead. We glory in tribulation because tribulation, huh? knowing that tribulation worketh patience and verse 4, and patience experience and experience hope. Verse 5 said, hope maketh not ashamed because the love of God has been poured forth in our hearts. Then, number 5, proven, tested, love for God. Proven, tested, love for God. By this I mean you have shown God that you love him and even you know you are convinced that this man loves God by virtue of how you are living, what you have done, what you are still doing. And we remember 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 9. Eyes have not seen, ears have not heard. It is yet to be revealed to the mind of men the things that God has prepared for those that love him. And one of those things he has prepared for those that love him is that they will reign in life because they are his ambassadors. That means they are his representatives. He will ensure that nothing touches the lover of God. For he said, touch not my anointed, do my prophets no harm. Let's summarize from here. First John chapter 4, verse 17, okay, 16, 17, 18. First John chapter 4, 16, 17, and verse 18. And we have known and believed the love that God had to us. For God is love, and he that dwelleth in love dwelleth in God, and God in him. Verse 17. And herein is our love made perfect, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment. So love, perfect love brings boldness in the day of judgment, because as he is, so are we. Love transforms you into Christ-likeness so that you manifest Christ-likeness in every aspect of life. Verse 18, he said, and there is no fear in love, no fear of failure, no fear of poverty, no fear of barrenness, no fear of singleness, no fear of shame, no fear of reproach, no fear of devils. No fear at all. Because you know God is in perfect control. And there is no fear in love. Perfect love expels every kind of fear from man. Because fear had torment. He that is afraid of success, afraid of dying of cancer, is not yet made perfect in love. If you are still afraid of witches at this level, your love has not been perfected. So, it's a call to grow into sonship. It's a call. Because the hair, as long as it's a child, different, is not different than a servant. 
even though he is ordained by destiny to be lord of all, but yet he is under tutorship and control. His life and the life of a servant are similar. Even though he's a son. But when he grows up, he becomes liberated from the elements of this world. The elemental forces. The things that control others. Control their marriage. Control their destiny. Control their happiness. Control their joy. He's liberated from it. And we say he is enthroned.